Holding the glass-mantled lamp high, Matt peered down the narrow corridor, deep in the belly of the stone. Not unless my life depended on it. That's what I promised. Well, burn me if it doesn't. Before doubt could seize him again, he hurried on, past doors, dry-rotted and hanging aslant, past others, only shreds of wood clinging to rusted hinges. The floor had been swept recently, but the air still smelled of old dust and mold. Something skittered in the darkness, and he had a knife out before he realized it was just a rat, running from him, no doubt running towards some escape hole it knew. Show me the way out, he whispered after it, and I'll come with you. Why am I whispering? There's nobody down here to hear me. It seemed a place for quiet, though. He could feel the whole weight of the stone over his head pressing down. The last door, she had said. That one hung askew, too. He kicked it open, and it fell apart. The room was littered with dim shapes, with crates and barrels and things stacked high against the walls and out into the floor. Dust, too. The Great Hold. It looks like the basement of an abandoned farmhouse, only worse. He was surprised that Egwene and Nynaeve had not dusted and tidied while they were down here. Women were always dusting and straightening, even things that did not need it. Footprints crisscrossed the floor, some of them from boots, but no doubt they had had men to shift the heavier items about for them. Nynaeve liked finding ways to make a man work. Likely she had deliberately hunted out some fellows enjoying themselves. What he sought stood out among the jumble. A tall, redstone doorframe looming oddly in the shadows cast by his lamp. When he came closer, it still looked odd, twisted somehow. His eye did not want to follow it around. The corners did not join right. The tall, hollow rectangle seemed likely to fall over at a breath, but when he gave it an experimental push, it stood steady. He pushed a bit harder, not sure he did not want to heave the thing over, and that side of it scraped through the dust. Goosebumps ran down his arm. There might as well have been a wire fastened to the top, suspending it from the ceiling. He held the lamp up to see. There was no wire. At least it won't topple while I'm inside. Light, I am going inside, aren't I? A clutter of figurines and small things wrapped in rotting cloth occupied the top of a tall, upended barrel near him. He pushed the jumble to one side so he could set the lamp there and studied the doorway. The Tyr Angrial. If Egwene knew what she was talking about, she probably did. No doubt she had learned all sorts of strange things in the tower, however much she denied. She would deny things, wouldn't she now? Learning to be Aes Sedai. She didn't deny this, though, now, did she? If he squinted, it just looked like a stone doorframe, dully polished and the duller for dust. Just a plain doorframe. Well, not entirely plain. Three sinuous lines carved deep in the stone ran down each upright from top to bottom. He had seen fancier on farmhouses. He would probably step through and find himself still in this dusty room. Won't know till I try, will I? Luck. Taking a deep breath and coughing from the dust, he put his foot through. He seemed to be stepping through a sheet of brilliant white light, infinitely bright, infinitely thick. For a moment that lasted forever, he was blind. A roaring filled his ears. All the sounds of the world gathered together at once. For just the length of one measureless step, Stumbling another pace, he stared around in amazement. The Tiran Grial was still there, but this was certainly not where he had started. The twisting stone doorframe stood in the center of a round hall, with a ceiling so high it was lost in the shadows, surrounded by strange, spiraled yellow columns snaking up into the gloom, like huge vines twining round poles that had been taken away. A soft light came from glowing spheres atop coiled stands of some white metal. Not silver. The shine was too dull for that. And no hint of what made the glow. It did not look like flame. The spheres simply shone. The floor tiles spiraled out in white and yellow stripes from the Tirangrial. 
There was a heavy scent in the air, sharp and dry and not particularly pleasant. He almost turned around and went back on the spot. A long time. He jumped, a knife coming into his hand, and peered among the columns for the source of the breathy voice that pronounced those words so harshly. A long time, yet the seekers come again for answers. The questioners come once more. A shape moved back among the columns. A man, Matt thought. Good, you have brought no lamps, no torches, as the agreement was and is and ever will be. You have no iron, no instruments of music. The figure stepped out, tall, barefoot, arms and legs and body wound about in layers of yellow cloth and Matt was suddenly not sure if it was a man, or human. It looked human at first glance, though perhaps too graceful, but it seemed far too thin for its height, with a narrow, elongated face. Its skin, and even its straight black hair, caught the pale light in a way that reminded him of a snake's scales. And those eyes, the pupils just black vertical slits. No, not human. Iron, instruments of music, you have none? Matt wondered what it thought the knife was. It certainly did not seem concerned over it. Well, the blade was good steel, not iron. No, no iron, and no instruments of... Why? He cut off sharply. Three questions, Egwene had said. He was not about to waste one on... Iron, or instruments of music. Why should he care if I have a dozen musicians in my pocket and a smithy on my back? I have come here for true answers. If you are not the one to give them, take me to who can. The man, it was male at least, Matt decided, smiled slightly. He did not show any teeth. According to the agreement, come. He beckoned with one long-fingered hand. Follow. Matt made the knife disappear up his sleeve. Lead, and I will follow. Just you keep ahead of me and in plain sight. This place makes my skin crawl. There was not a straight line to be seen anywhere except for the floor itself as he trailed the strange man. Even the ceiling was always arched and the walls bowed out. The halls were continuously curved, the doorways rounded, the windows perfect circles. Tile work made spirals and sinuous lines, and what seemed to be bronze metalwork set in the ceiling at intervals was all complicated scrolls. There were no pictures of anything, no wall hangings or paintings, only patterns and always curves. He saw no one except his silent guide. He could have believed the place empty except for the two of them. From somewhere, he had a dim memory of walking halls that had not known a human foot in hundreds of years, and this felt the same. Yet sometimes, he caught a flicker of motion out of the corner of his eye. Only, however quickly he turned, there was never anyone there. He pretended to rub his forearms, checking the knives up his coat sleeves for reassurance. What he saw through those round windows was even worse. Tall, wispy trees with only a drooping umbrella of branches at the top, and others like huge fans of lacy leaves, a tangle of growth equal to the heart of any briar choked thicket, all under a dim, overcast light, though there did not seem to be a cloud in the sky. There were always windows, always along just one side of the curving corridor, but sometimes the side changed, and what surely should have been looking into courtyard or rooms instead gave out into that forest. He never caught as much as a glimpse of any other part of this palace, or whatever it was, through those windows, or any other building, except... Through one circular window he saw three tall silvery spires curving in toward each other, so their points all aimed at the same spot. They were not visible from the next window, three paces away, but a few minutes later, after he and his guide had rounded enough curves that he had to be looking in another direction, he saw them again. He tried telling himself these were three different spires, but between them and him was one of those fan-shaped trees with a dangling broken branch. 
a tree that had been in the same spot the first time. After his third sight of the spires and the strange tree with the broken branch, this time ten paces farther on, but on the other side of the hallway, he tried to stop looking at what lay outside at all. The walk seemed interminable. When are... Matt ground his teeth. Three questions. It was hard to learn anything without asking questions. I hope you are taking me to those who can answer my questions. Burn my bones, I do. For my sake and yours, the light know it true. Here, yeah, the peculiar yellow-wrapped fellow said, gesturing with one of those thin hands to a rounded doorway twice as large as any Matt had seen before. His strange eyes studied Matt intently. His mouth gaped open, and he inhaled long and slow. Matt frowned at him, and the stranger gave a writhing hitch of his shoulders. Here your answers may be found. Enter. Enter and ask. Matt drew a deep breath of his own, then grimaced and scrubbed at his nose. That sharp, heavy smell was a rank nuisance. He took a hesitant step toward the tall doorway and looked around for his guide again. The fellow was gone. Light. I don't know why anything in this place surprises me now. Well, I will be burned if I'll turn back now. Trying not to think of whether he could find the Tirangrial again on his own, he went in. It was another round room with spiraling floor tiles in red and white under a domed ceiling. It had no columns or furnishings of any kind, except for three thick, coiled pedestals around the heart of the floor's spirals. Matt could see no way to reach the top of them except by climbing the twists. Yet a man like his guide sat cross-legged atop each, only wrapped in layers of red. Not all men, he decided at a second look. Two of those long faces with the odd eyes had a definite feminine cast. They stared at him, intense penetrating stares, and breathed deeply, almost panting. He wondered if he had made them nervous in some way. Not much bloody chance of that. But they're certainly getting under my coat. It has been long, the woman on the right said. Very long, the woman on the left added. The man nodded. Yet they come again. All three had the breathy voice of the guide, almost indistinguishable from it, in fact, and the harsh way of pronouncing words. They spoke in unison, and the words might as well have come from one mouth. Enter and ask, according to the agreement of old. If Matt had thought his skin crawled before, now he was sure it was writhing. He made himself go closer. Carefully, careful to say nothing that even sounded like a question, he laid the situation before them. The White Cloaks, certainly in his home village, surely hunting friends of his, maybe hunting him. One of his friends going to face the White Cloaks, another not. His family, not likely in danger, but with the bloody children of the bloody light around. A Taviran pulling at him so he could hardly move. He saw no reason to give names or mention that Rand was the Dragon Reborn. His first question, and the other two for that matter, he had worked out before going down to the Great Hold. Should I go home to help my people? He asked finally. Three sets of slitted eyes lifted from him, reluctantly it seemed, and studied the air above his head. Finally, the woman on the left said, You must go to Rudian. As soon as she spoke, their eyes all dropped to him again, and they leaned forward, breathing deeply again. But at that moment, a bell tolled, a sonorous, brazen sound that rolled through the room. They swayed upright, staring at one another, then at the air over Matt's head again. He is another, the woman on the left whispered. The strain, the strain, the saber, the man said. It has been long. There is yet time, the other woman told them. She sounded calm, they all did, but there was a sharpness to her voice when she turned back to Matt. Ask, ask. Matt glared up at them furiously. Rudion, light. That was somewhere out in the waste. The light in the Aeel knew where. That was about as much as he knew. In the waste? 
Anger drove questions about how to get away from Aes Sedai and how to recover the lost parts of his memory right out of his head. Rudion, he barked. The light burn my bones to ash if I want to go to Rudion. And my blood on the ground if I will. Why should I? You are not answering my questions. You are supposed to answer, not hand me riddles. If you do not go to Rudion, the woman on the right said, you will die. The bell tolled again, louder this time. Matt felt its tremor through his boots. The looks the three shared were plainly anxious. He opened his mouth, but they were only concerned with each other. The strain, one of the women said hurriedly. It is too great. The savor of him, the other woman said on her heels. It has been so very long. Before she was done, the man spoke. The strain is too great, too great. Ask, ask. Burn your soul for a craven heart, Matt growled. I will that. Why will I die if I do not go to Rudion? I very likely will die if I try. It makes no... The man cut him off and spoke hurriedly. You will have sidestepped the thread of fate. Let your fate to drift on the winds of time. And you will be killed by those who do not want that fate fulfilled. Now go. You must go. Quickly. The yellow-clad guide was suddenly there at Matt's side, tugging at his sleeve with those two long hands. Matt shook him off. No, I will not go. You have led me from the questions I wanted to ask and given me senseless answers. You will not leave it there. What fate are you talking about? I will have one clear answer out of you at least. A third time the bell sounded mournfully and the entire room trembled. Go, the man shouted. You have had your answers. You must go before it is too late. Abruptly, a dozen of the yellow-clad men were around Matt, seeming to appear out of the air, trying to pull him toward the door. He fought with fists, elbows, knees. What fate? Burn your heart! What fate? It was the room itself that peeled, the walls and floor quivering, nearly taking Matt and his attackers off their feet. What fate? The three were on their feet atop the pedestals, and he could not tell which shrieked which answer. To marry the daughter of the Nine Moons. To die and live again, and live once more a part of what was. To give up half the light of the world to save the world. Together they howled like steam escaping under pressure. Go to Rudion, son of battles. Go to Rudion, trickster. Go, gambler, go! Matt's assailants snatched him into the air by his arms and legs and ran, holding him over their heads. Unhand me, you white-livered sons of goats, he shouted, struggling. Burn your eyes! The shadow take your souls! Loose me! I will have your guts for a saddle girth! But writhe and curse as he would, those long fingers gripped like iron. Twice more the bell tolled, or the palace did. Everything shook as in an earthquake. The walls rang with deafening reverberations, each louder than the last. Matt's captors stumbled on, nearly falling, but never stopping their pell-mell race. He did not even see where they were taking him until they suddenly stopped short, heaving him into the air. Then he saw the twisted doorway, the Tiron Griol, as he flew toward it. White light blinded him. The roar filled his head till it drove thought away. He fell heavily onto a dusty floor in dim light and rolled up against the barrel holding his lamp in the great hold. The barrel rocked, packets and figurines toppling to the floor in a crash of breaking stone and ivory and porcelain. Bounding to his feet, he threw himself back at the stone doorframe. Burn you! You can't throw me! He hurtled through and stumbled against the crates and barrels on the other side. Without a pause, he turned and leaped at it again, with the same result. This time he caught himself on the barrel holding his lamp, which nearly fell onto the already shattered things littering the floor under his boots. He grabbed it in time, burning his hand, and fumbled it back to a steadier perch. Burn me if I want to be down here in the dark, he thought, sucking his fingers. Light, the way my luck is running, it probably would have started a fire and I would have burned to death. He glared at the Tiron Grial. Why was it not working? Maybe the folk on the other side had shut it off somehow. He understood practically nothing of what had happened. That bell and their panic. You would have thought they were afraid the roof would come down on their heads. Come to think of it, it very nearly had. And Rudion, 
and all the rest of it. The waste was bad enough, but they said he was fated to marry somebody called the Daughter of the Nine Moons. Marry? And to a nobleman by the sound of it? He would sooner marry a pig than a noblewoman. And that business about dying and living again. Nice of them to add the last bit. If some black-veiled Aeolman killed him on the way to Rudyan, he would find out how true it was. It was all nonsense, and he did not believe a word of it. Only... The bloody doorway had taken him somewhere, and they had only wanted to answer three questions, just the way Egwene had said. I won't marry any bloody noblewoman, he told the Tyran Griel. I'll marry when I'm too old to have any fun, that's what. Rudy on my bloody... A boot appeared, backing out of the twisted stone doorway, followed by the rest of Rand, with that fiery sword in his hands. The blade vanished as he stepped clear, and he heaved a sigh of relief. Even in the dim light, Matt could see he was troubled, though. He gave a start when he saw Matt. Just poking around, Matt? Or did you go through, too? Matt eyed him warily for a moment. At least that sword was gone. He did not seem to be channeling, though how was anybody to tell? And he did not look particularly like a madman. In fact, he looked very much as Matt remembered. He had to remind himself they were not back home any longer, and Rand was not what he remembered. Oh, I went through all right. A bunch of bloody liars, if you ask me. What are they? Made me think of snakes. Not liars, I think. Rand sounded as if he wished they were. No, not that. They were afraid of me right from the first, and when that tolling started, the sword kept them back. They wouldn't even look at it, shied away, hid their eyes. Did you get your answers? Nothing that makes sense, Matt muttered. What about you? Suddenly, Moraine appeared from the Tirangriel, seeming to step gracefully out of thin air, flowing out. She would be a fine one to dance with if she were not Aes Sedai. Her mouth tightened at the sight of them. You? You were both in there? That is why. She made a vexed hiss. One of you would have been bad enough, but two to veer in at once? You might have torn the connection entirely and been trapped there. Wretched boys playing with things you do not know the danger of. Perrin! Is Perrin in there, too? Did he share your... exploit? The last I saw Perrin... Matt said he was getting ready to go to bed. Maybe Perrin would give him the lie by being the next to step out of the thing, but he might as well deflect the Aes Sedai's anger if he could. No need for Perrin to face it, too. Maybe he'll make it clear of her, at least, if he gets away before she knows what he's doing. Bloody woman! I'll wager she was noble-born. That Moraine was angry, there was no doubt. The blood had drained out of her cheeks, and her eyes were dark augers boring into Rand. At least you escaped with your lives. Who told you of this? Which one of them? I will make her wish I had peeled off her hide like a glove. A book told me, Rand said calmly. He sat down back on the edge of a crate that creaked alarmingly under his weight and crossed his arms. All very cool. Matt wished he could emulate it. A pair of books, in fact. Treasures of the Stone and Dealings with the Territory of Mayenne. Surprising what you can dig out of books if you read long enough, isn't it? And you? She shifted that drilling gaze to Matt. Did you read it in a book, too? You? I do read sometimes, he said dryly. He would not have been averse to a little hide-peeling for Egwene and Nynaeve after what they had done to make him tell where he had hidden the Amerlin's letter. Tying him up with the power was bad enough, but the rest... Yet it was more fun to tweak Moraine's nose... Treasures, dealings, lots of things in books. Luckily, she did not insist that he repeat the titles. He had not paid attention once Rand brought up books. Instead, she swung back to Rand. And your answers? Are mine, Rand replied, then frowned. It wasn't easy, though. They brought a woman to interpret. But she talked like an old book. I could hardly understand some of the words... 
I never considered they might speak another language. The old tongue, Moraine told him. They use the old tongue, a rather harsh dialect of it, for their dealings with men. And you, Matt, was your interpreter easily understood? He had to work moisture back into his mouth. The old tongue? Is that what it was? They didn't give me one. In fact, I never got to ask any questions. That bell started shaking the walls down and they hustled me out like I was tracking cow manure on the rugs. She was still staring, her eyes still digging into his head. She knew about the old tongue slipping out of him sometimes. I almost understood a word here and there, but not to know it. You and Rand got answers. What do they get out of it? The snakes with legs. We aren't going upstairs to find ten years gone, are we? Like Billy in the story? Sensations, Moraine replied with a grimace. Sensations, emotions, experiences. They rummage through them. You can feel them doing it, making your skin crawl. Perhaps they feed on them in some manner. The Aes Sedai who studied this Tirangrial when it was in Mayen wrote of a strong desire to bathe afterward. I certainly intend to. But their answers are true, Rand said as she started to turn away. You are sure of it. The books implied as much, but can they really give true answers about the future? The answers are true, Moraine said slowly, so long as they are in regard to your own future. That much is certain. She watched Rand and himself, weighing the effect of her words. As to how, though, there is only speculation. That world is folded in strange ways. I cannot be clearer. It may be that that allows them to read the thread of a human life, read the various ways it may yet be woven into the pattern. Or perhaps it is a talent of the people. The answers are often obscure, however. If you need help working out what yours mean, I offer my services. Her eyes flickered from one of them to the other, and Matt nearly swore. She did not believe him about no answers, unless it was simply general eye said eye suspicion. Rand gave her a slow smile. And you will tell me what you asked, and what they answered? For answer... She returned a level, searching look, then started for the door. A small ball of light, as bright as a lantern, was suddenly floating ahead of her, illuminating her way. Matt knew he should leave it alone now. Just let her go and hope she forgot he had ever been down here. But a knot of anger still burned inside him. All those ridiculous things they had said. Well, maybe they were true, if Moraine said so. But he wanted to grab those fellows by the collar, or whatever passed for a collar in those wrappings, and make them explain a few things. Why can't we go there twice, Moraine? He called after her. Why not? He very nearly asked why they worried about iron and musical instruments, too, and bit his tongue. He could not know about those if he had not understood what they were saying. She paused at the door to the hall, and it was impossible to see if she was looking at the Tirangriel or at Rand. If I knew everything, Matrim, I would not need to ask questions. She peered into the room a moment longer. She was staring at Rand, then glided away without another word. For a time, Matt and Rand looked at each other in silence. Did you find out what you wanted? Rand asked finally. Did you? A bright flame leaped into existence, balanced above Rand's palm. Not the smooth, glowing sphere of the Aes Sedai, but a rough blaze like a torch. As Rand moved to leave... Matt added another question. Are you really going to just let the White Cloaks do whatever they want back home? You know they're heading for Emmons Field. If they are not there already. Yellow Eyes, the Bloody Dragon Reborn. It's too much otherwise. Perrin will do what he has to do to save Emmons Field, Rand replied in a pained voice. And I must do what I have to. Or more than Emmons Field will fall, and to worse than White Cloaks. Matt stood watching the light of that flame fade away down the hall until he remembered where he was. 
Then he snatched up his lamp and hurried out. Rodion. Light. What am I going to do? 